This is Lisa Ferris, CMO of Soundtrack Your Brand. You're listening to the business side of music. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar-chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. So, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. In the studio here today in Nashville, Tennessee, sitting across the podcast table, Jeremy Shiloh is passionate about creativity. He began playing guitar at age 12, but he was also so interested in using the guitar to make up his own music that for the first few years of playing, he never learned how to play a song in its entirety. You sound like me. (laughs) During COVID, Jeremy moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and needing a creative outlet, he ended up writing his first novel. Really? We're going to have to talk about that one, too. Sure. He then began tinkering around with the idea of making a video game and or a film based on the storyline of his novel. After a lot of research about the book, video game, and film industries, he discovered fledgling and unknown musicians, filmmakers, game developers, and writers all face the same three problems. Credibility, distribution, and funding. After extensive research, Jeremy created Circate Media Corporation. Did I say that right? That's correct. Yeah. Designed to solve those problems and to be a company that exists for creators. Jeremy. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. It's good to have you here. You're not a Nashville native, which very few people are. You you said you came from South Carolina originally? That's where I grew up. Yeah. What drew you to Nashville? Music. Um, that's the main reason. Even though you never learned a song in its entirety. Well, I have now. Oh, you have now? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Just for the first few years of playing guitar, I didn't. I would just get distracted by making noise, you know, trying to figure out what the instrument could do. And, and I would steal little parts of things and try to write stuff from what I would learn. Like I would hear part of a song and be like, I want to know how to do that. And I would learn that one little bit and then try to make stuff up around whatever the technique or or the idea was that I heard from whoever it was. So I think a lot of early songwriters probably do that while they're trying to find themselves. And, and I'm assuming that at some point you figured out how to write a song, how to put one together. But you also wrote a novel. Mm-hmm. And what's that about? When I got here to Nashville, it was um, the middle of COVID. So there's not much to do with music. And I, I wrote some songs, but I I thought, well, this is a good chance to try something different. And when I was a kid, in addition to guitar, I really loved science fiction and stories and movies. I was a big Star Wars geek and all that kind of thing. So I said, maybe I'll give it a go. And I just started writing. And um, yeah, I haven't published or anything, but I finished the whole draft of like however many 80,000 words or something like that, which is not like a terribly long book but it gets a, it gets into novel length at that point and um yeah it was fun what's it about it is about <clears throat> there are seven main characters uh and this book ended up being about just one of them i thought i could kind of fit all of them in there when i had the original idea but it ended up really just being about one of them and i think maybe it's more thematically driven where the it's actually a story that's kind of about what is the nature of fiction, really? Or what are the nature of stories? And so the idea is that this character discovers that he's in a story and that there's a way to travel from one story to another story. And he starts to explore that possibility. And then these different characters cross paths through how they go from one story to the next. And yeah, that's the the basic idea. And it's this ties into, you know, another thing I've done, which is not my bio, but I'm... 
studied philosophy in college and grad school. And so I've always questioned, like, what's the nature of reality? And I think that was kind of at the heart of this writing project was what's, you know, how do I know the different, how do I know that Sherlock Holmes isn't real or something like that? Right. right. So, yeah. Any in plans on releasing this book at some point? Maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm still, I uh, started revising it and I actually started a second book and then s- did some short story writing and, and enjoyed that. It's just a question of when and how much time I have to get all those things done. But I, w- I would love to do something with it. And, and it relates to the this idea of starting a company really is I, when I started to figure, once I finished the draft of the novel and started to revise it and then wanted to procrastinate on revising it, I was like, what do you do with the book when you finish it? And so I started researching if you know the traditional publishing industry and then the self publishing industry the other component is that i had these other characters that didn't i didn't really get to tell their whole story in that one draft of the book and so i i thought what if i could do a video game or something i just you know just why not sky's the limit and uh so i started looking to these other industries as well and it all of it just reminded me of being in music where it's really hard to figure out how to pay for your projects if you're an independent artist, it's expensive and it's hard to do that. And then it's also, if no one knows who you are, I think this is a, a big thing I'm passionate about. If no one knows who you are, how do you get discovered? And technology these days on one hand is great. and the other hand, it's terrible. <laughs> you kind of have to cater to algorithms of these various platforms. And, and that to me rubs against really being creative, right? And I think when I reached out to you the, uh, initially, the phrase that I've been using with people to talk about this is I don't think the best art rises to the top anymore. I think the best marketed art rises to the top. So I've been brainstorming on that problem. How do you figure out how to help really good art get noticed and discovered rather than if you're an artist have to figure out the whole game of self-promotion and like social media and YouTube, you know, just all the stuff that you have to do to sort of stand out in the world today. And I I don't think it's uh, effective in the right ways, right? Like I think it's, um, it doesn't reward the good stuff. It rewards the stuff that works for the companies, right? Like YouTube would rather you sit there and just watch YouTube videos. They don't care if they're good. They care if you're engaged because they can sell more ads. I think the same is true for Spotify or whatever. They don't really care what music you listen to. They just care that they can sell more ads. Right. That you're tuned into their platform. Well, let's talk about Circate and how that came about because it's really, I guess what you say, it's a self-promotions game. It's not a self-promotion it's game. It's not. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it is in a way. I, I, we, could, we could talk about how it works. So the... A long time ago, I'd had an inkling of an idea of like, what if you could do some sort of peer review system, right? And that was one aspect of the idea of where, and it goes back to when I would play open mics, like in South Carolina at little bars and stuff with my friends. It was kind of fun to just, sometimes we would pick the same title of a song and a couple of us would write a song of the same title and then we'd play it and sort of see like who liked which one the most you know even though we had totally different lyrics and it's totally different song just the same title you know and in that way you get like feedback and you get to grow as an artist and that part of being a creative person is really fun for me like connecting with people in that way and so there's this idea of peer review but also just sharing and enjoying and so the system, and then you, th- uh, sorry, and then another component is just things like the Grammys and how all that works, right? Those are peer review systems, like where you have a bunch of people who are sort of in this academy or whatever you want to call it, and they have a list of stuff, and they check it out, and they say, I think this is the best, and that's how the winners get selected, right? right? They it's vote from, for you. Yeah, they vote for you. And so that's another aspect, but I was like, what if you take it outside of the really famous people, and you just make a system that works like that for people who are totally unknown, <laughs> And you can't get any, you know, like you post your stuff on social media and maybe like your mom listens to it or something like that. And um, But that doesn't mean it's not good. And so I've been thinking, how do you f- kind of force interaction along those lines? And so the, the, the heart of the idea right now is this, um, to think of it like a game. So we could imagine that you had a song and I had a song and we'll say Dolly Parton was joining in or something. Each of us would put our song into the system and it would it say it matched us up really it's not that we get to pick who we play with it would just sort of match you up with other people and there's no way for like dolly parton's fans to vote they can't do anything she, she might have like a million people that would want to vote for her song as being the best 
of mine or yours, but they can't say anything about it because they're not part of the game. So it's just us three. So you, we would listen to the other two people's songs. So you would listen to my song, and you would listen to Dolly's song, and you would just pick which one you thought was the best. Of those two. Of those two. You can't vote for yourself. So in that way, it's not self-promotion. You have to vote for somebody else. It's nonpartisan. Mm-hmm. And then Dolly would choose between me and you, and I would choose between you and Dolly. And it allows for ties, so we could all vote for somebody different, and in that case, nobody wins. And that, I think that's part of how life works and part of how art works. Like, it's not always the case that someone's better than someone else, or that someone's song, I should say, is better than someone else's. But if two people agree, so this is the thing I think is kind of neat about it, is say that me and Dolly both agree that your song is the best, right? So, like, I like yours more than hers, and she likes yours more than mine. So you got two votes out of the three of us, and that would sort of give you a way to advance in the system. And, and uh, so there's a, what happens in the platform I built is if you get voted in that way, you get something called a standing, and it'll move you onto a public list. So it's almost like a tournament. Almost like a tournament, yeah. Almost like a tournament. For people who like sports and stuff, it's very much like that. So you'd get moved up uh, into uh, a higher rank in that system, like on the billboard charts or whatever, right? Now you've got a ranking based on what two of your peers think. And then you would just go into another tournament. And if you keep winning, you keep going up. It's indefinite. Like you can go up as far as you want. Um, But it's dynamic in the sense that if you lose, you can go down, uh, which I took from like soccer, for example. You can get, if you're a top tier team, but you finish in last place, you get relegated to the lower league. And then the next team from the lower league comes up. So this idea that it's dynamic, but it's all in good fun. It's not really about, I don't know, it's not meant to say like you're a loser or something. That's really just to be fun. It's a great way to test out your project, your Mm -hmm. creative juices, so to speak. Yeah, and it's not even this big, it's not like you're putting out to Facebook or whatever else. It's just get feedback from peers. But my hope is if enough people will use it and, and it really becomes a place where good art is noticed and rises up like that, People who are just average music fans will go to this site and and say, wow, this one's like ranked really highly. I'm going to check it out. And they'll start to check out music that maybe they've never heard from artists they've never heard about. And one thing um, that I've talked the folks I've talked about it, I think one thing that's exciting is if you're not very good at marketing, but you're a really good songwriter, then there's no reason you can't stand out in this kind of system. That's exciting to me because I, th- I think there are a lot of very talented people who are not very good at figuring out how to be heard. I think a lot of creative people have a tendency to be introverts more than extroverts. I know that maybe they get out on stage and they sing their heart out because they're very passionate about the music that they've written. But when it comes to one-on-one conversations or interviews or promoting themselves, it's almost like that part of the magic bullet's not there. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think being an introvert is a is an asset. If you're going to I mean really if you're creating something like songwriting or writing or whatever, you're doing that by yourself somewhere for a long time. Uh, not that you can't do that as an extrovert, but I think for an extroverted person that would be a draining type of process and for an introverted person that's more something that fills you up, right? That being alone and creating thing. Uh, but then you got to get out and share that somehow, and I think that part is is hard for introverts. Yeah, and I, I think the solitude of a songwriter uh, has a tendency to allow, once again, those creative juices to flow a little more because they're not dealing with distractions. You don't have other people around you. Maybe the TV's off. You know, you're just focusing on what you're doing. That's my, my favorite part of writing or music is just writing. Like, I, that's the part I like, just doing what you're saying, you know, turning off the stuff and just sitting down with a guitar and, and writing. You know, it's, and then my next favorite thing would probably be recording. I love being in the studio. It's real fun. So, In the studio with us here today in Nashville, Tennessee, is Jeremy Shiloh. We're going to take a break, get a word in for a couple of our sponsors, and when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. 
Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Since 1963, Korg has been creating new experiences in music and performance. That is what drove the creation of some of Korg's most legendary products, such as the Poly 6, the M1, the Electribe, the Triton, the Minilog, the Kronos, Wavestate, Op6, and most recently, the Nautilus, which is what we have here in our studio. Korg is dedicated to creating new, innovative, and uncompromising instruments which maintain the highest quality to inspire music makers, past, present, and future. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products and start creating new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, Jeremy Shiloh is sitting across the podcast table. So we know what Circate is Mm -hmm. at this point. Let's talk a little bit of how it works and how the the creative person gets involved with it if you don't mind sure yeah um so it's a website so you can go to circate.com c-a-c-i-r-c-a-t-e now is it up and running at this point and kind of in a beta testing version okay. so you could create an account and sort of tinker around there's a demo version and you can submit stuff and and i um I, right now the thing that's most valuable to me is feedback because i sort of built the thing that i would want that I think other people might like. But in reality, my brain only can figure out so much stuff. And I really want to, f- to be building something that's exciting for creators who f- would want to do something like this. I think there are people who maybe are more interested in becoming famous or whatever. And that's maybe this isn't the thing for them. I don't really know. Um, but I think there are a group of people that just love the craft, you know, and this would be a f- uh, just a fun thing to do as someone who loves the craft. And so how it works currently is um, you use links to stuff that already streams things. And right now I have it limited to Bandcamp, which is one of my favorite sites for artists. I think they're a very artist-friendly platform. So you can put you can sell merchandise through Bandcamp if you want to. You can sell your music. It's, uh, it's a really great site. And so the way it works is you to get into a tournament, you just submit a link to one of your songs on Bandcamp, and it takes that link, and that's how you would play. You would listen to the, go to the other person's Bandcamp to hear their song. It's a pretty straightforward process. It's just one little, you know, kind of like Google, you have a thing you type in and hit enter, you know, it just has a thing where you uh, put your link and hit submit, and then, and then it'll connect you to other players from there. So, but we're in beta testing right now, and we'll be launching in January. And to kind of incentivize use, I've, um, I'll be doing a competition with this where there'll be a prize for some studio time and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, let's talk about that. That's, that's going to take place here in Nashville. Mm-hmm. So if we have a listener in Brazil, they would have to figure out a, a way to get here. Sure. Uh, yeah. Travel costs and lodging aren't involved, but they could still submit something yeah, sure. and, and yeah. possibly be a part of that tournament. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the prize, and this is... We, we, um, there's an independent artist fund that uh, I was connected with in town that's sponsoring it. So they're the ones who are paying for the studio time, which will be at Sputnik Sound, which is a studio here in town, kind of where right over near Blackbird and all the other studios. It will be with Mitch Dane, who's a Grammy winning engineer. So it'll be three days of time with Mitch. He's a really good guy. I've worked with him before. Which is cool. It's a great studio, and the package would include if you wanted to. It's just time, right? So if you wanted to have bands come in, it would allow for that, and that wouldn't be like extra. Or uh, sorry, musicians come in and play. Like if you wanted a full band thing, the package would kind of cover that. If you just wanted to sit there with an acoustic guitar or a piano or whatever, 
by yourself and bang out as many songs as you can in three days, that's fine too. So you, it's just up to the artist who wins to decide how they want to use that time. Yeah, and it, it'll be slightly different than the thing where you rise in the standings. It's still the same three-player tournament thing, but it'll be like multiple rounds of elimination so that we can whittle it down to the top three. And then the, one of the top three uh, who wins will get that prize. But it's not limited to the number of people that can enter to be involved in this. I mean, you could no. have several hundred people sure. get yeah. involved. Yeah, It's just this whole tournament process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that idea because it really, I think, to me, it sounds like it creates opportunity upon opportunity because not only are you getting involved in this, but now you're starting to interact with other creative people mm -hmm. of, of your kind, of your liking. Yeah. And uh, it's a great way to maybe get some, uh, maybe mentoring each other. Or, sure are bouncing ideas off of each other. Yeah, and I hope this system connects people in that way. And um, as it gets more technologically advanced, I want to build in capacities where you can submit written feedback if you want to on somebody's music. Say, like, man, I, I love the chorus or the verse didn't do it for me, but the second verse was great or whatever, you know, so it can... You've got the hook, but maybe you don't have the... Yeah, the, yeah. And yeah. So, so it really can be about artists helping other artists in the pursuit of great art, right? Where it's not in the pursuit of my career and what's good for me, but in really just out of the love of music and the love of songs. Yeah, and, and I hope it's fun. Like, I love to hear stuff I've never heard before and, and, and to get a chance to be connected with the people who are equally passionate about the craft, so. You talk about the beta testing mm -hmm. for this. And you're looking for feedback from people who will get involved in the beta testing aspect of this. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for in particular? Sign up and try it out and then email feedback, right? That's uh, like, I don't like how this does that thing. Or I did this thing that I, I thought the app was supposed to do and it it didn't work or what, you know, whatever. So you got software is a weird thing where there people don't always use it the way you think they will. And so there, there can be bugs. And so that's what I've been doing with some friends is like working through trying to find if there's any places where there's bugs or whatever. I think I've got most of that, uh, hopefully all of that sorted out and hopefully all of it sorted out by January. But, um, that, it's just part of the game, you know, when you, and I built it myself, and I so I had to learn how to code and, and do the whole thing, which was really fun. But I'm also, that's not like I was a professional software developer and then built this. I was a guy who wrote songs and had a vision for this thing and didn't have thousands and thousands of dollars to pay somebody to build this. And so I figured I better learn how to code and do it myself. And so that's what happened. <laughs> so there's a website, obviously, and there's a phone app, too? No phone app. It's all, yet. It's okay. all through the website. And the... The main, it will work on your phone. You just go to your phone and do it. And I don't th think for the capabilities it has now, there's no real reason it would need to be on a phone app. Uh, certainly at some point that could be pretty cool. But the proof of concept, I think, will be enough on a website. And the nice thing about a website is it's not platform specific, right? So I don't have to... You don't worry about an Android and, or yeah, iOS. Or, yeah. yeah, I don't have to like build two apps or whatever. So this is a, the most straightforward way to make it accessible for everybody. Is there a limit to the number of songs they can submit? Are you looking for one song at a time? or For the competition? Yeah. No, I, I think what it will be, yes, there will be a limit, I think. I'm ironing out the rules, but the idea right now is that it will proceed in a few rounds. So I think one song per round, and the thought would be to let people pick which song they want per round. So like maybe they really... I don't always know which song of my own I like the most, and so it's kind of hard just to from that perspective to make somebody pick just one song. And it could be the case where, <clears throat> say the first round I didn't win and I'm like, oh, maybe I should try one of my other songs. And so the thought would be that to allow that flexibility for people gotcha. so they're not stuck with just one yeah, song. Yeah, that makes sense because the, the critical reception that you're receiving from your peers or that audience, like you said, oh, I think this is the song and then you go, eh, maybe not yeah, so much. Yeah, you gotta read the room as it were, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. And so I want to allow people to do that. And I think also in the sense of playing a game, it's fun to be able to have some strategy. And so that gives you choices. And I think that would make it more fun for people. But it would make it more fun for me at least. So. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of that's the key word here is it's, it, we talk about gameplay and whether it is or whether it isn't. But at the same time, 
you want it to be fun for the person that's using it. Yeah. Yeah. No one's going to use it if it's not fun, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's not like an oil change in your car, which isn't super fun, but you kind of need it. It's not that sort of thing. So, <laughs> so I hope I, it's fun. I want to jump way back, if you don't mind, because sure. I hear these creative juices of yours flowing as you as you create this program, this software. Was this something you'd been kicking around for quite a while, or did it just pop into your head, you know, one night laying in bed? No, it's been a long, it's been a long time coming. I think I've been thinking about like as a musician. I mean, I taught. I all I did for a living for almost a decade was music. Um, like almost the entirety of my twenties, that's all I did was I taught guitar lessons and played gigs, and that was that was my income, which was fun. And uh, you know, the internet has changed things. Companies like Spotify and stuff. And another component is I try. I, I did a lot of cover gigs and stuff, and some friends of mine and I did build an app for that would take like song requests for cover artists and stuff. Like if you're just at a so you're in Broadway and you hear some guy that's playing covers all day long and you wanted to use your phone to submit a cover. That was the kind of idea there. It ended up not being a successful project in terms of critical, you know, people taking it. But I learned a lot. Um, so there's that bit of the piece of two. So I started thinking about software for the first time. That was the first time I ever really started thinking about software, and that was 2016-ish. So it's been... That was probably the germ of it is like the first venture into like, how do I marry music and software and do something that can help musicians? And that was in kind of the cover artist space. And then so I've been thinking on it since then more. And then the book piece. And, and I think what really there's been a lot of things. It's hard to tell the whole story. One of the things that I remember I called my friend. I was like, what if there's some voting thing? Right. And you could vote. And he says, OK, well, what if some famous person gets on there and they just tell all their fans on Instagram and then they just win. And so I was like, well, I have to figure out some way to level the playing field. So that's part of how I ended up in this sort of peer review thing that doesn't let fans participate. And that's, I think, a unique component of this is like, what, wouldn't it be kind of cool if I could have a song that was competing against Taylor Swift's song, right? Without Taylor Swift's fans, s millions of Swifties coming in right. and really diluting mm -hmm. the, the the voting pool. Right. Yeah. So and so that there's that piece, like that little conversation with my friend. He's like, "Well, yeah, but if you're famous, then you're just going to win." And I was like, "Well, that shouldn't be the case, right? For what I'm trying to do." And so there's that piece. There's a piece of the app project I did with some other friends that failed, and so I learned a lot of stuff then. And the other bit of it, I think, was really writing that book and thinking about how would I do a multi medium project, right? Like how do I do video games? And, and I'd never looked at the video game industry. I'd never looked at filmmaking as an industry and I'd never really looked at book publishing either. And, but I'd looked a lot at music and I figured out there, I think there are, everyone kind of has these problems where a big one is if you're unknown, like and this is what I call the credibility problem. You have no credibility. Like I put a thing out, it might be awesome, but unless I have someone say, you know, discover me and they have credibility and they say, go check out Jeremy, it's not going to work. The alternative is you go on the road and you, you do it the hard way, which I think is a great way to do it. Actually, you go out and you play a bunch of shows and you build up your fan base over 10 years and you got to think about it like a 10 year, 12 year. It's a beta test that you're doing yeah. over that time. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, so the, I think the answer to how it, how it started is it's been a lot of years in the making, and then I finally got to to a point where well, I think what the real turning point, I remember I had this moment, I was reading about Amazon's self-publishing terms and like what you get paid if you publish a novel on, or self-publish a novel through Amazon. I had this thought, I was like, I, I, this is what went through my, or actually I said it out loud, I was sitting on my computer, I was like, I would literally pay to have a better option than this. And in that moment, I was like, what I think is wrong, and since we're talking about the business side of music, the business side of creativity, what I think is wrong with the technology platforms like Amazon or Spotify or whatever is that the customer is the consumer. And in a market-driven economy, customer is always right. And so I can't tell Spotify to give me better terms because I am not their customer. They don't care. They do not care about 
musicians because they don't have to because musicians are not Spotify's customers. They're just not. They don't make any money off musicians in the traditional way. Musicians are suppliers. They supply the product. They're independent contractors. Yeah. And I think that's fine and good if that's what you want. But, uh, but there's sort of two ways you can get people to work together for economic advantage. One of them is you can create a union, right? Uh, and there are unions and, you know, there's studio player union here. If you play in the studios around Nashville, you can join a union. If you go on tour, you can join a union. And, and those things are okay. But the other way, I think, is you just work together as customers. And that's sort of what I think is the real thing I'm driving out here. Not to like start charging a bunch of money to artists, but to say, if I can get a bunch of musicians to become customers of Cirque, and by that I mean you make the demands, we meet the demand, right? It's just supply and demand. And that's why I've ruled out the fans. I don't want the fans to be my customers because I don't want to serve them primarily, right? I think they'll be served in a different way. If creators are set free to create what they want to, if musicians can write the songs that they want to, and they can be creative in that process. Without catering about to the, market. Yeah, yeah, catering to that market, worrying about those yeah. influencers. Without worrying about that whole thing, I think there's some great stuff that's going to come out of that. And I think people will notice. So this is where I think it, you shift. if you shift it to you have a bunch of creators that sort of congregate together rather than in a union, like a labor union or something, they do it as customers, right? And they build then as customers, they demand the platform that they want. And then they make the art that they want. People seek out great art. They really do. And I think people will find the stuff that people make if it's there. At least that's the theory. Maybe it won't work, but it, it almost becomes a co op of sorts. Yeah, it's that's a good term. Yeah. 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 You're all under one roof. But it's a lot of independent resources working to help each other and help yourself at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it'll work or not. I don't know if I can get folks to work together in that way or not. Um, I think you can more so these days than, say, maybe before COVID. Yeah. Because people, when when the pandemic hit around the world, it wasn't just here in the United States. Yeah. You had to learn how to work independently. And at the same time, seek resources of other people to where you had to really help each other. Yeah. yeah I remember during COVID, a buddy of mine was like, hey, do you want to sing on this Almond Brothers cover that he was doing with some friends? And they're all just recording it at their houses, you know, and doing a video. And I was like, sure. And so I just set up a mic and he sent me the tracks. And then, you know, he put together a little video just for fun, right? Because you couldn't go play gigs and stuff. Right. and. Yeah, so I think you're exactly right. People got way more creative about being creative during COVID because you had to. <laughs> I love that. In the studio with us here in Nashville, Tennessee, is Jeremy Shiloh. You're listening to the business side of music. It may have been Tammy Wynette who sang Stand By Your Man, but it was actually Nancy Jones who stood by the legendary George Jones for more than 30 years and helped bring him to the light. Now in her new book, Playin' Possum, readers get an intimate look at the country music legend through the eyes of his wife and partner. Nancy knew George Jones better than anyone. The good and the bad, the horrendous and the hilarious. Married in 1983, George quit his wild and wicked ways for a while, but Nancy learned all too soon that there were demons holding a strong grip on the man she loved. People who knew the possum credit Nancy's tenacious love, faith, and encouragement for saving George's life and rebuilding his career. For the first time in Playin' Possum, Nancy Jones reveals the true insider perspective and little-known stories about the country music legend, his battles with cocaine, alcohol, abusive behavior, battles with himself, and against the demons that sought to control and destroy him. Read the compelling first-hand account from the woman who refused to give up on George Jones. Play in Possum is available now. Order your copy today from nancyjonesbooks.com, Amazon, and more. 
Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives, whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhance Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, business side of music, Jeremy Shiloh is sitting across the podcast table. When you talk about the circuit tournaments. Mm hmm. Do you have a ballpark figure of how many tournaments there will be? Is that going to be based on the number of entries, the number of submissions? How's that going to work? For the songwriting challenge? Yeah. yeah. The, I, so I had to figure out the math of how to work this out. And oh, Lord, we're talking about math I'm not going to get into it too much, but I actually uh, I got online. I was finding all this stuff like, how do you run tournaments? And so I've been reading like research papers by people in sports science magazines and stuff who look at the fairness of tournaments and all that kind of stuff. And I think because the tournament, most tournaments is kind of a two teams, like like one team versus another team, or in tennis you have two players. What Most engagements are that sort of way. This is three people. So it's not a two-player game, it's a three-player game. So that makes it a slightly different thing than you might look at, say, a March Madness bracket or something. So each bracket will be three people. And the best of those three will advance. and. To the next round of three people. To the next round of three. And that one becomes part of those three. Yeah. yeah. And, in to, and to make that work, there will sometimes need to be buys, and that will be a random thing. So every once in a while, you might randomly be selected where there's not an exact number of three. Say there's four people left, right? Well, how do you make a three-player tournament? You have to give somebody a buy. And so they, they wouldn't participate in a tournament, so they get one round out, and then... You kind of so, and then there's also something I had to c- come up with, which I call a wild card, which is sometimes you might have too few, so you might end up with like two. And in that scenario, what do you do? I don't have, I can't do a three player tournament with two, so I do a random wild card, which means I just randomly select from somebody who's already been eliminated that they get to come back in and compete in that tournament. So that's how that'll work out, so that there's always a, a one person wins, right? It'll go in three rounds, so instead of a double elimination, it will be three, like a triple elimination thing. So the first round, you will have, say we have 30 players, you'll you'll get grouped with two others, and then whoever wins will go to the next round, and if you don't, you don't, but that's okay, there's two other chances that you'll get. And the thought will be the first round will have a winner, okay? And then the second round, that winner will not participate, they'll just sort of be set aside. In the second round, we'll have a winner, so now we've got two of our final three. In the third round, we'll have a winner, so we'll have our three of our final three. That will all be randomly seeded, because I don't have any previous information. This is one thing, like in in basketball or whatever other kinds of tournaments, that you have previous information about how the rankings of the teams. I don't have that, so it's going to have to just be randomized. So uh, that's another reason for doing multiple rounds of elimination, is it might be the case that the best three songs, for example, are together in the first round and then two of them get knocked out well then that's okay we've got two other chances and and hopefully in that way we can at least try to help ensure that the best wins and i don't know that it actually will i hope it does i hope that it will and um i'm excited to try it out and and really it's it's free for people to enter there's no downside i think you know one of the things I wanted to ask you is costs involved in this? Not for the artists, yeah. And and one way we'll try to level the playing field as well, uh, for example, is, you know, you don't submit your full band recording. So the it'll be a cell phone demo is what I'm going to ask people to do. Like, just get out your cell phone and uh, play your guitar or piano or whatever. One, one vocal, one accompanying instrument, and, and record it on a cell phone. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. It's about the song. It's not about the production, that sort of thing. And you'll upload your song to Bandcamp, which is super easy. They already have that system figured out. And then you submit your link to your song on Bandcamp. You know, you'll to listen to somebody else's song, you just go to follow their link to their band camp and check out their tune and and then you'll come back to circuit and, and vote right so it's pretty straightforward uh no bells or whistles just kind of pick which one and and go forward with it so 
and and it's free just to the cost you know if you got a cell phone and an instrument and you can write a song like I'm trying to make it as and Bandcamp is free. There's no cost to use Bandcamp and all that. So so far as I know, it will have no cost other than what songwriters already have, i.e., like a phone and an instrument and the ability to write songs. Something so, they should already have anyway. Yeah. Okay. So we talk about that you're currently in the beta testing of all of this. Mm -hmm. Where can these people go to find the program? Circate.com. You just go to the website there, and um, there's a little explainer video uh, thing I did kind of as a joke with a friend of mine. You can check that out, and you can create an account, and then you could submit a song if you want to. It's just been a couple of my buddies right now. I've not been, like, widely – I think I've told, like, a handful of people just to sort of get some sense. But if more people want to hop on there, and then you can just email feedback at circate.com. If you wanted to send me feedback and say, hey, I, you know, this didn't work right or I love this thing or what if it worked this other way that I think would be cool if it were different in some way. So, yeah, that's that's it. And um, it's pretty straightforward. I, and just keep building it once I learn more about what people like and don't like. So, Jeremy, thank you so much. A lot of great information. I, man, I look forward to this being released and. I hope we can help out when the time comes. Oh, thank you so much. I'm excited about it. It's been a pleasure to be here. Here's a shout out to our loyal listeners. Without you, we wouldn't be one of the most listened to music industry interview podcasts in the world, including achieving number one status in many countries around the world, according to Apple Podcasts. If you enjoy our show, please check out our Facebook page at the Business Side of Music Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and definitely hit the like button. While you're at it, go to our page on YouTube and click on the Business Side of Music Podcast to subscribe. You can check out our webcasts on there and get to see me and our guests, such as Jeremy here sitting across the table in the studio, along with Buddy the Music Dog, who occasionally makes his entrance and exit. Last but not least, check out and follow us on Twitter at Biz Music Podcast. That's B-I-Z Music Podcast. Until the next time, thanks for tuning in. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.